So thank, thank you again for coming, and uh, please welcome Bruce Adams. So, distinguished members of Hallwall's audience and staff, tonight I'm going to provide you with all the documents and all the evidence pursuant to the case of Richard Huntington. You're going to see the art, hear the stories, and get to the truth. Uh, sorry, just influenced by the, the current events. Um, so, uh, let me start by asking a question. I don't know if this will be relevant or not with this audience, but um, who's an artist out there? How many of you? Okay, of those, how many, raise your hand if you were ever reviewed by Richard Huntington. Okay, now, keep your hand up if you think his review is spot on. Okay, that's pretty good. That was most of you. So. Um, yeah, he was a major uh, important part of the community as a reviewer many years ago. And um, way back in the 1980s, my first real experience with Richard was, oh, let's see, first of all, I, I wanted to mention something. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about his background, and I got ahead of myself. Uh, he taught uh, studio and art history courses at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, he was the art critic for the Courier Express before the Buffalo News, and I don't know how many people know this, but in 1982, he served as the visual arts director at Art Park. And then in 1985, he became the critic for the Buffalo News until 2007. And so I was about to say my first kind of contact with him in any uh, respect was as a, um, a subject of one of his reviews, and uh, it was... He, he was, I, I thought it was a pretty good review, you know, pretty fair review, um, positive. But Richard was known as a very difficult reviewer. And so there, were, there was one particular phrase that stuck out in my head, and I've never forgotten it all these years. Art school fakery. Uh, and he, it was, it was true. Um, he, I, I thought uh, I was doing at that time. I'd been, I'd gone to New York and I'd uh, been looking at the uh, neo expressionists, and I was kind of influenced by that. And what I was doing is I was painting, and then when I would get kind of done with the paintings, I would decide they didn't feel expressive enough, so I would add like, you know, expressive brush strokes over the top. Most people would not notice this, and but I kind of, I knew it. And then when he commented on it, and that's the phrase he used, I realized he knew it too. And that's when I knew this guy is good. And um, really, he could, he, I felt like he could read my mind. Um, so how I met Richard. Uh, you have to understand, we had one newspaper at that time, the Buffalo News, the Courier Express was, um, Oh, I forgot to say, it was the oh. Buffalo News. Um, and um, I, uh, I actually avoided Richard at the, in those days because um, I kind of knew him. I'd see him around at hall walls and things like that. But I was, uh, um, you know, I was kind of hesitant to go up and, and talk to him as an artist because I was afraid that, like, you know, he's kind of a celebrity in a way. And I thought there would be that sense that, um, you know, I didn't want to be that guy that talked to the critic and tried to, you know, talk about my art and so on. So I was walking away all the time at, at, during conversations. And I remember talking to my wife and saying, um, you know, I think Richard really wants to talk to me. I think the next time I see him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue talking to him. And I did. And I think it was at Elizabeth Lycata's and Alan Bigelow's wedding. And we talked for a little while. And then sometime later, I got a call from him out of the blue, and uh, he said, uh, I'm, I'm going to move into a new studio. Would you be interested in moving in with me? Because uh, it's a little bigger than I can afford. And I said, you know, how do you know we're going to get along? And he said, I think we'll get along OK. That was 28 and a half years ago. And we've shared a studio ever since. We've moved once, so we've been in two places. Um, 
this talk tonight is going to go fast uh, and still not cover close to everything I could possibly talk about. And each one of Richard's works, I could spend a, a great deal of time on it, but I'm going to move along because I hate boring lectures. Um, though Richard wouldn't want to acknowledge this, and I know he wouldn't want it because he has denied it in the past, uh, we, I think we influence each other. Um, I know he influences me, uh, but he, um, you know, he denies that I have any influence on him. Uh, our work at times has been similar, both in style and subject matter. So that's actually Richard on the left and mine on the right, and you can see the similarity. Uh, I like to think of it as kind of like, you know, Picasso and Brock, where you couldn't really tell the difference between their work. But pretty soon our styles diverged. And uh, as I do this, there are three things, as I talk about this tonight, there are three things you should think about in terms of Richard's work. The first is um, that everything he does involves appropriation. The second is his work is usually somehow rooted in art history. And those two things we have in common. Uh, the third thing, though, is uh, he has a knack for finding sources front-loaded with inherent cultural significance or things so oddly obscure that you wonder where the hell they came from. Um, we're polar op opposites, uh, theoretically, and in terms of the way we approach art, but uh, you know, we kind of meet in the middle stylistically. Richard, I call his approach a romantic approach. To him, art is a mysterious, intuitive process. It comes from the soul. Uh, paintings reveal themselves as they're painted. I have what I call an intellectual approach. To me, art is a cerebral process. Comes from the mind, paintings are executed according to a plan. Uh, this picture came from uh, an interview. Oh, I don't want my the thing to show on there. Uh, an interview with uh, Ellen Ryan uh, years ago. I, now I can't find my, now I can't find the arrow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hold. When I'm, there it is, I got it, okay. No, it's, it's the problem, when it goes off my screen, it goes on that one, and, and I couldn't find it. Uh, so uh, she did an interview with us, and it was, it's published online, and this is a, a small ex excerpt from it. She was talking to us about uh, the topic of our lively studio discussions, which we have over the years. Some might, you know, hear them and think they sound like arguments, but they're just, we just like to uh, disagree with each other. So um, she was asking, so what kind of things would you talk about? And my answer, well, the ongoing thing is our differing views on the nature of making art. I tend to approach it from a sort of intellectual, rational point of view, Richard. Me not being rational. You know those diagrams of dog brains where they have the huge amounts of space devoted to biscuits? So that's like my brain. That much is devoted to art making. But then there's a little tiny sliver, a little pie slice for rational stuff. So my approach tends to be more emotionally based. Me. I will say, this is the painting I want to do, and I'll do it. Now, I'll watch Richard paint something, and under every painting, there's 10 other good paintings that he's painted over. He's never satisfied. I go, that looks great. Yeah, I don't like it. I'm going to do it over. I say, but I like it. And he says, it's not time yet. Uh, Richard says, see, I call that the sugar plum stage where you think you're doing, I'm sorry, where you think you're going to do it the first time through. You have these visions of a great painting dancing in your head, and then the reality, at least for me, cuts in at a certain point, and I have to start making stabs in the dark, trial and error, endless revisions. So this is the Richard that I don't know. This is 1970s hard-edged abstract Richard. I see these paintings around the studio, but he never did them while we were together. So I'm really not going to talk about this too much. However, um, I think when you look at the work I am going to talk about, to some degree, Richard has always, his work is always connected to abstract art, even when he does figurative work. Um, so I call this, that was all the introduction, penetrating the impenetrable. Why Richard Huntington's art often leaves me feeling gobsmacked 
in five parts. Part one, beauty rules, late, late 90s. So Richard found a book from the 1940s on a beauty guide for women. And, uh, you know, you could imagine what it was like. He used the text of it, ironically, to satirize outdated attitudes of beauty and poise and uh, women's social role. Uh, so he, he took the uh, little fragments of uh, dialogue from the book and used them as text, and then the text becomes the title. So this one's called Dressing is Particularly Important for the Woman Who is Not Truly Beautiful. Another thing, we sh another thing he and I share is we often paint a figure against uh, a flat, abstract space. Um, in the case of Richard, that flat abstract space is often the most intense part of his painting, the part he probably spends as much or more time on than the figure itself. And that goes right back to his abstract work. So, you know, even when he does a simple geometric abstract um, shape, the background becomes the emphasis. And in this particular painting, I just, I'm really intrigued by this thing back here. Um, at this point, I know that he was working from a model and from photographs, so this could have been something in the studio. But it, it, those are the kinds of things that intrigue me about his paintings, that, that when I look at them, I just, I'm impressed by. Uh, and this little shape here, I don't, I don't know, it sort of echoes the shape of the figure. We don't see your mouth. Oh, no. Well, then I guess I'm good. I should be on the screen. Okay. Okay. So, so right here. Yeah. Okay, when I, do th when I do this at school, the pointer shows up. I don't know what happened there. Um, I'm tired down there. Yeah, I know. And, uh, but you can see, I, I think you can sense here how many layers there are on this painting. Uh, this one, uh, she's a fast worker, this one. Watch her. My, what a pretty sight, and so is that bed. Neat, well-turned corners, covers, smooth as smooth. You got all that dialogue in there. Uh, so again, this is a figurative work with a strong element of expressionistic abstraction. I'm sure at some point he stops seeing these as representational and he sees them as, uh, as um, almost like abstract paintings. Is this as focused it can be? It seems a little out of focus. Guys in the back, looks okay to you? It looks sharper on my screen here. Um, so yeah, I think as he, I, I think even though this is a figurative piece, I believe he begins to think of them in, as a sort of abstract uh, work of art. This one's called uh, "Because Opinions Are Sharply Divided as to the Possible Glamour of Extremely Bright Hues." It's wise to use restraint in your use of color. Um, what impresses me about this one is the way he works the text. And this, these are one of those areas that Richard has influenced me. I've used text at, time, at, at times, and I look at his, and I'm always fascinated by the way he approaches it. <coughs> it's kind of as if um, the, it was written on a chalkboard and erased, and then drawn over, but sometimes it's not erased, there's bits of it that isn't properly erased, and then sometimes it's erased with yellow uh, down at the bottom, and I, I think that you know contributes to a richness to the work and to the way the text is used that is very uniquely Richard. And it's one of those things that looks easy when you see it, but try to do it, it's really difficult. This one's nervous and fidgety hands are an offense against charm, but hands knowingly used with a sense of beauty and discretion are a great contribution to charm, even if the hands themselves are not lovely. Uh, and everything about this is everything I've said already. Some skin is already delicately colored in a naturally beautiful hue. Now, um, that's the title of this one. Speaking of skin, uh, I, t I asked Richard in preparation for this, you know, his thoughts on the issue of the male gaze. And let's just say that he didn't respond well to the question. Uh, <laughs> He, I don't, he did not give me an answer. So if I were to guess, here's what I think. I think he would be unapologetic for finding beauty in the female figure or for being male. Um, 
He often satirically references historical art tropes or pop culture, threading the needle between exploitation and commentary on exploitation, between ugly and beautiful. Um, his sources include, include foul material or live models, often posed in awkward or culturally dated poses, which brings me to the great model debate. Um, we've had, we had an on, for a long time, we had an ongoing um, discussion. And I mean, this was spread over a couple of years. Uh, I don't pay to use models and, you know, I'm not gonna talk about my reasons tonight because it's really about Richard, but I have reasons. And, and he felt, you know, you really have to pay models. And we would have this conversation back and forth and he would go, Bruce, you know, you, 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 you. and eventually his best argument he finally came up with was um, he went to, you're stealing their soul. And I said, Richard, do you think their soul is only worth $20 an hour? <laughs> Uh, and that was kind of the last time we ever talked about that subject. Although he wrote about this whole thing and you can find that online. Um, on the subject of pinups, this is called uh, Fries and Coffee, uh, acrylic and pencil on shaped raw plywood, which is another one of those things I really admire about Richard. The shaped raw plywood were things that he found laying around the studio, like in the hallway from some other um, you know, uh, some other business. They had die cut some things and there were these scraps. And he, I mean, I saw them, didn't think anything of them. He saw them and thought he could use them to incorporate them as a sort of three-dimensional abstract component, component in a two-dimensional painting. And I, I love these. In fact, I have one of this, these uh, series, this group of work in our house. Uh, but talking about influencing each other, I had had uh, a box of uh, old 1950s pinups uh, calendars that I had purchased somewhere and a book on pinups. And I was using pinups. And then Richard said, oh, can I, can I borrow those? And I said, yeah. And so then he was using pinups. So we were doing that at the same time. And that was one way that I think, you know, my presence had some impact on him. Not that he had never had an interest in that before. Um, now, I don't think his, this, by the way, this piece doesn't really go with the ones we were just seeing, but I wanted to bring this point up. I don't think um, he has a nostalgia specifically for pinups. I think he has a nostalgia for the feelings he experienced in a different time for pinups. This is something he writes. I remember quite exactly my first encounter with a pinup. I was maybe 12, down in the basement of a friend's house, when I spied, reflected in a mirror, situated in a back room, a calendar displaying an image of a buxom blonde woman who had just emerged from the bath. The woman held a towel up over her body in a failed attempt to deflect the gaze of anyone who happened to be looking her way. The towel partially covered her breasts, and to my great regret, denied any visual access to her pubic region. But what floored me was that her bathroom was also equipped with a mirror, a full-length mirror, no less. By this double mirroring, one real, one painted, I was able to get a futive but very complete view of the lady's naked backside. Heaven have mercy. I was blasted with a sense of guilt that was overlaid with a peculiar physical excitement. So... That's my take on Richard's interest in, in pinups, is I think he has a nostalgia for those feelings uh, from his youth. Uh, part three, whereabouts unknown. This is the early to mid 2000s. So uh, Richard loves the work of early modernists and like all of us, laments the senseless loss of art to uh, war and fascism. Whereabouts Unknown was based on the idea that art lost to the Nazis could be redeemed by contemporary reinterpretations. Now, he had this book, you know, that he found, and it was about uh, German Expressionism, and there were a number of images in black and white that said Whereabouts Unknown or Lost or Destroyed or something to that effect. And so he got this idea for a series where he would recreate these. 
And he quickly realized it was futile to attempt to duplicate the original, so he reimagined them in his own style. Um, I think in this particular case, the text that's over the top, kind of just intrusively over the top, uh, puts a fine point on the idea that you can't re recover things by obscuring the painting in a visually intrusive way. Uh, the futility of the project is what makes it poignant to me, illustrating that culture lost can never be recovered. History can't be recreated. I don't know if that's Richard's intent, but that's the feeling, that's the vibe I get from it. This is called Heckle's Sister, the Acrylic and Wash. And this one is uh, Max Beckman, Der Strand, The Beach, and it's ink on paper. Villard, woman hiding her face, oil on canvas. Carl Hoffer, Esther and Ruth, pencil and collage. I think this is Richard's, I think this series is Richard's most heartfelt work. In fact, it's probably the only series I can think of that he ever did that is devoid of humor or irony or puns. It's very straightforward, sincere. Uh, this is uh, Peckstein's, who knows if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, smoke, uh, Smoker, which is oil on canvas. Now, there are some that he did several times, which I think reinforces that idea that the desperation, I should say, of the project, you know. So this one he did, he did in an in a, uh, acrylic and pencil and then in a pencil drawing. And I just think the way he kind of obsessed over them enhances that idea that uh, you cannot recreate these things. Another one like that, Lovis Korn, Kornith, Kor, sorry, Kornith, and I'm going to botch this too, Todd and Madchen, pencil on prepared paper. But another version of it, Death and the Maiden, acrylic on paper. So um, while I'm here, this seems like a, a, a good opportunity to talk about another kind of interesting dynamic between the two of us in the studio. So I mentioned earlier that Richard is very serious and... Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, to him, it's, art is a kind of spiritual process. So I, I come into him one time. We, our, our studios are separated by a wall. I come into him one time, and he's sitting there like 20 feet away from a painting just looking at it. And I figure, okay, this is a good time to talk to him. And I said, uh, Richard, there's no answer. And I think, well, maybe he just didn't hear me. And I say, uh, and I go, Richard, and nothing. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe petite mal uh, epileptic fit, and he just uh, is oblivious to the fact that I'm there. And I said it again, Richard, and he goes, no. And I, and I go, but I, he goes, stop, I can't talk. <laughs> what an asshole. So I go back to my studio. No, really, I mean, it was like prima donna, right? Richard, uh, sorry, I wanted to interrupt the, uh, the studio's on fire. Um, but no, so I just went back to my studio and, and uh, painted. And then a little bit later, he comes in. Can I interrupt you? Of course, of course. And uh, he says, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just like really focused. I didn't mean to. And I looked at him, I went, okay, uh, you know. There's no point in getting angry at somebody. Every, we all have little odd characteristics. Um, cottage industry, late 2000s. So um, he, uh, I, as, as uh, John mentioned in the introduction, uh, I also write, do our criticism. And um, Richard actually was the person that convinced me to try being an art critic. He had probably tried this for about three years and just periodically saying, you know, why don't you write a review? And I said, Rich, you know, I'm illiterate. That's why I can't write. Uh, it, it really, it was truly the invention of the computer that made it possible, you know, with cutting and pasting and thesaurus and everything. But uh, I was really hesitant to do it. And finally, I tried and, and I continue to do it today. So many years later, 
uh, he asked me to write the, uh, the, the catalog uh, essay for this series of work. So I'm going to read a very, very edited version of that right now as I go through these images because it'll kind of illustrate some of what you've already seen, but it will also uh, it particularly set up what's coming next. So I started out by um, talking about how Raphael often borrowed source material from other Renaissance artists and transformed it into something Raphael-esque. When a couple years back, Huntington announced his plan to create a series based on the work of Thomas Kincaid, the painter of light, it seemed like a rich joke. Huntington's creative process is often bewildering, oh, sorry, bewildering, border, borderline mystical, but always intelligent. I knew then his intent to parody or satirize Kincaid would not be uh, that simple. Kincaid's idealized lighthouses, bucolic woodlands, Christian imagery, and homey country cottages epitomized populist saccharine kitsch. What intrigued Huntington is Kincaid's assembly line consistency. Like the Model T Ford, each painting has the exact same formal solution, he explains, and all come up to the same emotional level and then stop. This interchangeability of Kincaidian components provides a launching pad for something far more intricate than a one, uh, sorry, than a visual one-liner. Uh, Huntington plays against the tropes of landscape and scenic painting, utilizing time-worn conventions, arched bridges, smoking chimneys, cobbled paths, and thatched roofs, while simultaneously transcending them. In Huntington's hands, they become signifiers, formal components presented with deadpan irony. Like an accomplished vaudeville acrobat, Huntington is always juggling at least three ideas while balancing precariously on a thin tightrope between aesthetic refinement and ham-fisted gracelessness. Uh, wry historical references re reside discreetly amid dense painterly brushwork or nestled unassumingly between snippets of collage. Several works include stenciled dot patterns, a reference to Kincaid's impressionistic impulses via George Seurat by way of Roy Lichtenstein. These dots also appear on what the artist refers to as surrounds, painted canvas borders that encase a central image acting as visual quotation marks around nearly conventional landscapes, like marquee chaser lights reassuringly, reassuringly reminding us that this is all just an act. Here and throughout, the artist plays abstraction against representation as Kincaidian elements are lifted out of context and place within abstract environments. Watching Huntington in the studio creating art from Kincaid matter is like witnessing an alchemist mysteriously transforming lead into gold. Images are scanned into Photoshop, digitally dissected, endlessly manipulated, and then printed, sometimes in multiple layers. These may remain prints or be used as references for paintings or they might be physically cut and collaged or attached to a canvas and painted over. Completed works are often scanned back into Photoshop and manipulated again in a continuous Mobius strip progression, endlessly folding back on itself. Huntington's workplace is piled with false starts, dead ends, practice runs, and more often than not, successful works, any of which may at any moment be snatched up for revision. The exhibition's title, Cottage Industry, can be read both as a sly commentary on Kincaid's factory-style methods or Huntington's own ceaseless production. Whether any individual work survives or is relegated to the scrap heap, scrap heap is not dependent on its cleverness, but rather its visual cohesiveness. Art supersedes hilarity is the motto Huntington lives by. I've tried for years to understand why one work makes the grade and another doesn't. Only Huntington knows when the source material has been successfully transformed into something Huntington-esque. So once again with the titles. So uh, Flood with Floating Roof, acrylic on canvas. So one of the things I like about this is it's a relatively realistic looking uh, roof isolated from the, from the original uh, uh, source against this 
primarily abstract background, and particularly over on the right over there, that the, the kind of play of negative space, the push and pull of, of what's in the back and what's in the front. Um, that's all indicative of, of Richard's way of playing objects off of um, abstraction. Same here. Cottage industry, who's afraid of red, yellow, and blue? Oil on acrylic on five assembled canvases. Uh, it's an obvious reference to Barnett Newman in the title, but also to uh, Mondrian in the uh, forms. Um, I asked Richard in preparation for this, I said, Richard, where did, this, where did that cottage industry title came from? And he said, oh, that was your idea. Uh, <laughs> I had forgotten. Uh, he, he said, we were talking about it, and you, you just commented, why not uh, call it cottage industry? And he did. And he used that title here, too. Uh, Bridge with glowing light. The glowing light is that this little thing over here, which apparently is something Kincaid does in oh really it's blocking huh? Some of uh, does in some of his paintings to represent spirituality. And Richard just thought it made an interesting little thing. Morning mist, night moon, digital print, acrylic and collage. Some of these I don't. This one's called Christmas Vignette, but I don't know what medium. I'm, it's, I'm pretty confident it's just paint, but I'm not sure if it's on canvas or paper. And then the master laid down his brush. This is oil on canvas. This is, if you look at the center part, it could be just a pretty much a Kincaid lift, pretty straight painting there. Uh, but that uh, frame around it is what, you know, as I said, kind of cues the viewer in that this is not serious. This is one I particularly like, particularly like, and it's a it's a uh, example of how he works with Photoshop and uh, you know created this kind of uh, abstract and then turned it into a painting. As I said in, in the coming series, which actually kind of <coughs> precedes and then and goes after this work, uh, everything I just said about this series applies, and from here on out. Kincaid roof and lips, parentheses, after Bruce Adams. Now, here's another interesting thing. Occasionally, Richard will go into my studio and photograph something I've painted and incorporate it into his work. And so after the fact, he'll say, uh, you don't, you mind? And I, of course I don't mind, you know. People, artists appropriate all the time. <laughs> but he does that. I want you to keep that in mind a little bit later. Uh, Shining Beacon, acrylic on three panels. Okay, so next one is part four, Spanish lessons, late 2000s, 2010. So around 2007, Richard started uh, going down to Mexico for half of the year, which is where he is right now, luckily. Um, he, was, uh, he was influenced by the culture he found there, and he, in this particular series, he combines images from such sources as wall decorations, Mexican crafts and other arts, cartoons from an old Spanish language book, and prints from Mexican satirist Jose Guadalupe Posada. In combining these sources, he sets up clashes between the ridiculous and the horrifying, the frivolous and the consequential. And he merges this again with abstract devices. He calls these lively, somewhat satirical, always ironic hybrid works. Um, so this one is done exclusively in uh, Photoshop uh, from found materials. And, and, and again, this is when I talk about how Richard's work always leaves me gobsmacked. It's, it's so, when you see this, it's so obvious. It just looks like a great uh, composition. And, and very visually interesting. But, you know, how he decides, like, what to cut away, how this tree, oh, I'm doing it again, I'm here and you can't see it, how the tree kind of extends into the other, and the, and the circles that are ornaments over here become kind of float over into the other part. Those are the kinds of things, and, and he cuts parts of these images away, uh, you know, exactly how much or why, it's very intuitive. And then this became, the source material for an actual painting. So this is acrylic on paper from that piece. This is called Stagecoach Robbery, doubled acrylic on paper. Now, 
I gotta say this. Uh, this is another way that Richard has influenced me. Um, watching him, but I taught him, by the way, how to use Photoshop. Uh, and, uh, and, and then he, he, you know, started learning on his own. Uh, but periodically he'll say, I, I don't know, I don't, I can't, I don't know how to do this. And I'll come over and show him. And, and yet when I look at these things, I'm always amazed because they how does he know where, what to cut away, how, what to distort, how much to lighten something, how much to overlap? How do you know when to stop, uh, when things are not dense enough or become too dense? Um, he does it, and this one I'm sure was manipulated in Photoshop as images and then used as source material because this says it's a painting. Uh, and I, I wouldn't have known this was a painting um, if I just looked at it. Because a, a lot of the ones he does that are done in, in a, the computer look very similar. But I'm always mystified. It's, it, it, again, when you look at the end results, it looks easy. Just like slap some stuff over one another. It's not. It's really hard. And it, it always amazes me. Madonna with uh, Rivera stick figures, digital print. Portrait of the Mexican general um, Aldama with decorative scroll, acrylic on paper. I think there's a, I feel like there's a bit of a Magritte reference here, you know, with the uh, scroll that blocks the face. Um, but there's an interesting story that goes with this. Uh, so I visited Richard down in Mexico three or four times. And it, uh, where they live in San Miguel, it's a pretty small city. So, uh, you, you know, in a week or so, you see the whole thing. And like him, I went around photographing interesting subjects. In fact, I walked around with his wife, Wendy, and we both were photographing. We were like finding the same images. And so sometime later, I did a piece, and this is my piece, using that same design that I also found. And he saw it and he was kind of annoyed. It was, it was kind of like, uh, but Bruce, you're, you know, I did that first. Now this is the guy that comes over to my studio, right? And, yeah. and photographs my art and puts it in his art, but I used the same image and I felt like I used it completely differently, but he said, but it, you know, even goes right over the image. Uh, and the truth is, I probably did see his and probably was influenced and unconsciously or consciously or half consciously. And that's my argument that, you know, when you share a studio, you influence each other. Uh, Pepsi Madonna, digital print. Still life with French fries and shot man, acrylic and collage on paper. Little Red Riding Hood and falling man, pigment print. Yeah, this is another one that I just, it's so dense and so complex and yet visually it works. And I, I just have to keep saying it. it I'm, always surprised, I'm always mystified when I look at this. And, it, and I'll tell you, I'm more mystified when I tried. I tried doing sim, something similar with my own work. Uh, seeing him do this, I thought, oh, I'm gonna, I, basically I wanted to make prints. And uh, yeah, I, it's really hard to do this. I know, for instance, though, that he also thinks stuff I do is really hard, because uh, he says I could, I would never have, I could never do that. Um, this one, I, sometimes a cigar is only a cigar. Um, he he went back and did this uh, Mexican series again later, or revisited it, and this was from the later piece. And I think this was too. Mayans surprised by Cezanne Amazons after Rivera. I mean, how many layers are there there? Uh, archival pigment print. Part five, homages. Amazons and Cezanne and eight pagers, various times right up to today. So I lumped all these together because I knew at this point we'd be starting to run out of time. There are really many more series I can't even really talk about, but I wanted to just cover a number of loose ends here, things that I find interesting that he does. So homages are the first one. Um, this is called Peasant Carrying a Sack After Malay. So somewhere out there, there is a Malay painting with this peasant in it, but I can't find it. I was looking for it. Um, he often references artists from other eras. 
And these tend towards satire, irony, or just puns. Sometimes he piles homage upon homage. Uh, a peasant from Malay is a company. Now, this is, you, you wouldn't know this from looking at it. I'm pretty sure no one would guess this. But it's accompanied by a vague interpretation of a Fragonard landscape. Yeah, right? You wouldn't know that. And he doesn't care. Um, for him, it's the, sat the personal satisfaction he gets out of knowing that he's, that he's played this Fragonard, you know, feathery brushstrokes against this solid Malay uh, figure. Malay basket carrier with Brock easel, acrylic and pencil on canvas. Malay butter churner. Acrylic on canvas. I think he's doing a riff on Malay now. I don't think these are actually, I know those, I actually know that model, so I know these are ones he posed. But my favorite's coming up. I see this around. M Millie Malay. <laughs> I, I love the sort of um, frivolousness of Millie, you know, romping along with her, whatever that is, uh, that she's wearing against this laborer that's working in the background and the balance between the two and the way the canvas is split. This one has been up in our studio off and on for long periods and I always admire it. Malay peasant with false Mondrian. So this is, I think, another example where Richard is interested in two dissimilar ways of uh, handling space. What he calls aggravated flatness on one side, the Mondrian, and representational illusion on the other, which is not all that representational and it's fairly flat itself. But he likes butting these two things against one another. Okay, just somebody tell me what's the reference here? What are the. Uh, what? The uh, ones in the grass, right? No, no, no. It's a Rembrandt. Yeah, it's a Rembrandt. Yeah, yeah, I, I see why you said that. But yeah. so that's something else he does, and I always enjoy this being in the studio, you know, I'll see something and I'll immediately have that, that feeling of like familiarity, like I know that, you know, I know where that comes from. He, you know, he's a student of art history and uh, this one is actually called Nixon in Vietnam after Rembrandt. So one has to presume that the images around the outside are actually uh, appropriated from documentary material of Vietnam, probably the Vietnam War, I would assume. But that figure in the middle, you know, I immediately knew that was Rembrandt. But here's the thing, when you really see the Rembrandt, and here it is, you see how dramatically different. For, they're facing opposite ways for one, even though Rembrandt was known for his very, for the time, expressionistic uh, or expressive kinds of brush strokes. It's not nearly as expressive as Richard's. I also want to point out the way he, um, you know, treats again the background very expressionistically, and it kind of almost goes right into the figure uh, and, and moves around on the bottom here. Uh, as I said before, I really think that he stops looking at these at some point as representational and thinks of them as kind of abstract compositions. Uh, so that's, that's one of the things that really intrigues me about his work, when you see that reference to something familiar that you know, and it's just in a very fresh way. And then sometimes obscure, Van Gogh's bedroom, acrylic on canvas. So I've, I've seen this in our studio. It's hanging there now at forever. And I kept wondering what this was, I found out. It's an enlarged interpretation of a sketch from one of Van Gogh's letters to his brother that detailed how he wanted to position one of the, his versions of La Bersou um, between two of his sunflower paintings. Above and below, in mirror image, are freely painted takes on an x-ray of the floor of Vincent's bedroom at um, Arles. Uh, I don't think there's any x-rays of Vincent's floor out there. I think he painted it in kind of a reverse uh, way and then decided to say that it was an x-ray. But just that idea that there's a very, um, uh, uh, Van Gogh painted his bedroom about three or four times and the floorboards are a very distinctive part of the painting. And so he picked up on that and used it as an as a abstract component with these obscure images in the middle that you would never know what they were unless you asked or looked it up or found out. Uh, another 
homage is uh, Blonde with Pearl Necklace after Roy Lichtenstein. He, he um, did a series of works that were based on Roy Lichtenstein paintings. Now, I didn't mention this before with the Kincaid stuff, but um, the, he found uh, some kind of material, I, I don't remember what it was, that had holes you know, in rows, and he used that, and he puts it over the canvas, and he, he'll paint through it, and then it dries, and he'll do it again and layer over it. Um, so it's kind of a mechanical approach to doing it, but as you saw with the Kincaid, he does it in a very loose way. Now, this is not his. This is de Kooning, late period, when de Kooning had dementia. And he found this uh, book of de Kooning's, of his late period paintings, and he, he, I remember him remarking that it was amazing that this person that <coughs> had, you know, become, had, had dementia and was, dementia and was uh, you know, not, couldn't think clearly, uh, could still paint. And he was very intrigued with these, and he ended up using these in a lot of different uh, works. For instance, Our Lady of the Perpetual de Kooning Shapes. Um, this is integrating uh, source material from Mexico with the de Koonings. And this is quite a big three panel piece. And he has told me that the, um, he uses the de Kooning as kind of to represent the, the, you know, the radiance of the Virgin coming out. Uh, Amazons and Cezanne, he did a whole series of these they, they always a little bit baffled me when I saw them, but I, I, I talked to him eventually and, and got to understand what he was doing. First of all, it's all dark humor as far as I'm concerned. The Amazons in these works have cut off their right breasts as in, they do in mythology to facilitate the use of bow and arrow, but in Richard's world, ironically, they now use cannons, making that pointless. Um, and then this one uses her skirt to protect her hands from the hot cannon, resulting in an Amazon pinup. Uh, and, the, and the figures invoke uh, German expressionism while the settings are adopted from Cezanne paintings. All that is in here. He, he, there's all these layers of meaning in his work. Defending Amazon, sunrise, oil over digital print. So he would have made a digital print somehow in, um, he might have made a digital print from a, uh, from a, a regular mechanical print, uh, a uh, monoprint. He does some monoprints. So then he might have photographed that, scanned that or whatever, and manipulated it, and then painted over it. Um, the cannon smoke evokes, invokes uh, Chinese cloud paintings, which you'll see a little bit later, but also comics. Defending Amazon, Moonlight. So if you look at these two, these are both painted over digital prints and the same digital print, but you can see how much they differ. This one is two Amazons in the midst of battle, oil on canvas. And again, one of them is uh, both, actually both of them are using their skirts to protect their hands to acquire that pinup quality. Uh, eight pagers. I don't know if you know what eight pagers are. They're also known as Tijuana Bibles. They're palm-sized pornographic comic books that were popular in the United States from the 1920s to the early 60s. Uh, their, popular, their popularity uh, peaked during the Great Depression and also the war years. They're very collectible. Uh, that became another source for Richard. And Two of the characters that appear in Eight Pagers often are Dick Tracy and Mussolini. So he started doing pieces that riffed on Eight Pagers with uh, Mussolini. This is called Mussolini in Love, Oil on Canvas. Now, all these works cover a lot of styles, but they always reference high art in some way or another. This is called Mussolini Gets Near Nirvana, and the the, um, you can see the, it's collage and digital print and acrylic. Uh, and you can see in the background the reference to the, the uh, Chinese um, clouds that I, I mentioned before, but there's the de Kooning again. And then I don't know if that's a lift from an actual eight pager or something he drew. Uh, then Dick Tracy is the other character. And Dick, he just did a whole series of Dick, Tra I kept seeing these Dick Tracy's. This one's called Good Work, Sally. Uh, and this one is uh, Dick and Mal. And this is, I believe, 
straight out painting. But then he digitally uh, manipulated it. And this one is called Dick Tracy takes one on the kisser digital print arm by Bruce Adams. Another time when he went into the studio, <laughs> photographed one of my paintings, took an arm and incorporated it into this. Uh, I don't know how many people know who Joe E. Brown is. Anybody? Yeah, it's kind of obscure now, but you might know the face if you don't already. Yeah, you've seen him before. He was a very popular character actor from like, for like four decades, from like the 19, maybe 30s on up through the 60s. And he was another character that appeared in uh, these eight pagers. I don't know how often, but Richard just got into it. And so he started doing all these Joey Brown riffs. And I'm seeing him in the studio and I'm just going, what? Like, why, why Joey Brown? I was fascinated by it, but I just, it was just crazy. And only recently I found out it came from those eight pagers. So this one is called Joey Brown is Turned Down. <laughs> And Babs teasing the Dickens out of Joey Brown. <laughs> that was acrylic on paper. Joey Brown calls the lightning down. This is collage archival pigment print and oil on paper mounted on board. You, so you can see what he does. Um, there's, there's a first stage. Maybe it's his own painting or a print. Then scanning, then cutting, then you know re-scanning and manipulating and then pasting and then painting. It's just a really complex process. Joey Brown and Cezanne, monoprint, so tying those two together. And then he's done some other cartoon characters. This is Mr. Wolf, who I don't know. And there were a few others that he gave me images of, but when I looked at them, they were really out of focus, <laughs> so they're not in here. But he's done a couple other cartoon characters. Um, this one is Zimzum, acrylic and charcoal on canvas. And Zimzum refers to that part of the Kubala in which God, in his initial ubiquitous state, casts about for a way to create a universe outside his all-consuming self. And the entire thing is based on forms uh, from the de Kooning paintings. <coughs> so those are all you know, lines that he, he appropriated from that. When I first met him, he had just uh, finished or was in the late stages of the Rube Goldberg variations. These were, he was, and so this is going way back. He was uh, taking Rube Goldberg cartoons, which if you're not familiar, you can look it up. It's too hard to explain right here, but you, you've seen them and turning them into paintings. And then this one was scanned and then turned into a digital print. So this is actually more recent, but it was based on something very old. And this is called Study for Class Struggle, which is an acrylic on canvas. Um, this is one of my absolute favorites. I love the way the figures are just, let's say, off screen, and how the center of interest is this white field that if you see it in person, it's very richly painted, as I've mentioned before. And there's, a, there's sort of a reference to abstract shapes, but also a reference to bricks. And you know, you get a sense that something is happening, but you can't quite tell. I just love this painting and it's, it's hanging in our studio. By the way, these are hang, the ones I'm mentioning are hanging in our studio, are for sale if you're interested. Uh, so um, Richard, when he just recently came back from Mexico last, this was one of his uh, most recent paintings. This is a self-portrait. And so is this. Now, this is called Bust of Ricardo, uh, oil on canvas. And this is exactly how Richard looks when he comes in my studio to comment on my work. Um, now, I, as I said before, he would, if he were here, he would tell you he likes my work. Um, I know that, not because he's ever told me, but because he tells other people. Like, I just ran into Ben Perone and Wegmans and Ben said, oh, Richard tells me you're doing some really good paintings lately. I go, really? Because he never tells me, you know? His wife has said that too. Oh, Richard said, you gotta see what you're doing. Oh, really? Yeah, he, and that goes really back to when we first met. Um, he, and he was the critic for the Buffalo News. Not when we first met, but first decided to have a studio. And I said, um, you know, I don't want, if I get a studio with you, I don't want you to stop reviewing me because you're the only guy, you know? I mean, eventually you had stringers, but you were the guy. 
And, and I, I didn't want to uh, have you stop doing that. And he said, okay, so here's the deal. You know, I won't talk to you about your art at all. And then um, I'll review it. After a few years, he decided that too many people knew and it would seem like, you know, there was, it was nepotism. So um, he, he kind of stopped at that point. But then at that point, he was already um, then split between uh, art and theater. Originally, it was only art. I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned this in the beginning. Originally, if you had an art show in Buffalo, it was reviewed. Uh, every art show in Buffalo is reviewed. Most of them in Niagara Falls, like Niagara Community College, but would occasionally. But if you were in Buffalo, there were like two or three reviews in the newspaper every week. And Richard did most of them. And then, um, you know, eventually they split them between theater and then eventually he retired and they replaced him with Colin and now they replaced Colin with nothing. And we don't really have uh, a, a critic in the Buffalo News anymore. So, um, so yeah, Richard will come in the studio and he never says, oh, I love your work, but he will say things like, uh, the collarbone on that isn't just right. You know, you should take a look at the, the separation between the figure and the space. It seems like it needs to be more defined. Or my favorite is he will say, um, I'll, you know, be early on, I'll be just have a quick sketch and he'll go, ooh, I like that, you should leave it just like that. <laughs> Meaning, instead of fucking it up like all the other ones, you know, <laughs> just stop there. Um, but honestly, uh, if it isn't apparent, I, I really love Richard and uh, he has been a big influence on me. I think I've influenced him even though he won't admit it. Uh, we've been great friends. And that's the end. Thanks.